Straight ahead on 12 News, a sudden health shock. And every time I would tell my doctor this, he would say, oh yeah, you're healthy. Let's not worry about it right now. A Rogers resident goes from no need to worry into a battle for her life. Plus, time for repairs, how the city of Plymouth hopes to pay to fix its aging ice arena. But first, Robbinsdale officer sued. A former Gopher basketball star accuses police of excessive force. 12 News starts right now. Hello everyone, a former Gophers basketball player has filed a lawsuit against a Robbinsdale police officer for allegedly using excessive force. The incident happened last year when Melvin Newburn was stopped as he was driving back to his Robbinsdale home. Delane Cleveland joins us now with more. Delane? Now Mike and Shannon officer Brian Sloach pulled over Newburn because he suspected that Newburn was driving while intoxicated. Minutes later, Newburn was knocked to the ground while in handcuffs and suffered a concussion. Now he's suing for $300,000. According to the report, it's about 10 o'clock a.m. when he's pulled over. Melvin Newburn was driving north on Victory Memorial Parkway after a trip to the doctor's office. There's going to be some discussion outside here. Officer Brian Sloat stopped Newburn on suspicion of drunken driving and put him through a field sobriety test. At some point in time, Officer Sloat decides that he's going to have Mr. Newburn get into the back seat of his squad car. Newburn's attorney, Andy Noel, showed us the squad's dash cam video and took us through every moment of the traffic stop. This is the first attempt. The video shows Newburn, who is 6'5 and weighs more than 300 pounds, appearing to have difficulty fitting into the back seat. He's a soft-spoken guy. He really doesn't raise his voice throughout the entire incident other than to say, I can't. After two attempts to sit in the car, Newburn tells the officer that he can't. Backs of squad cars are tight spaces for just about anybody. So it's clear that he was having trouble, that he wasn't just trying to be difficult. The attorney says Sloat arrests Newburn for obstructing the legal process. He cooperates with the frisk, so here Officer Sloat's going to check him for weapons. Places him in handcuffs and gives him verbal warnings to get into the vehicle. After again saying he can't, Officer Sloat strikes him in the leg. When you basically take the leg out, bad things are going to happen. Newburn screams and falls to the ground. The first shriek you heard was when the leg strike was delivered. A second officer then arrives and places Newburn in the back seat. The test that the courts and the jury will use is whether the force was objectively reasonable given all of the circumstances. And in this case, it wasn't. A urine test showed that Newburn was not driving under the influence that day. Meanwhile, Robbinsdale Police Chief Steve Smith wouldn't comment on the issue because the department hasn't been served with a lawsuit yet. But he did say that Brian Sloat is a veteran officer in good standing with the department. If this case uh, goes to a jury trial, the resolution won't happen for at least another year and a half. Mike? All right, thank you. Brooklyn Park Police have released dash cam video showing the aftermath of Thursday's bus fire rescue. You can see the black smoke billowing out of the front of the bus and four students, two in wheelchairs, safely along the curb. First student bus driver Al Lewis says he's not a hero, but he is getting credit for getting the kids to safety. A first student spokesperson says he did the right thing. He opened the passenger door as well as um, his driver's side window in order to create a backdraft that would allow the bus the smoke to escape the bus rather than to fill the bus. So while he was minimizing the smoke, the nurse on board took the two um, students to the back of the bus to the emergency exit. Lewis then got the other two students in wheelchairs safely off the bus. It's still unclear, though, how that fire started. A Plymouth couple is recovering after a fire ripped through their home late Thursday night. Just before midnight, a fire spread from the back of this home on Trenton Lane to the rooftop. When emergency responders arrived, one person was outside, but the other person couldn't walk, so police officers had to help that person escape. Both people went to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The cause is under investigation. A grocery store worker and an attorney are among a dozen everyday people recognized for their responses in emergencies. Among those receiving awards from Plymouth Police were Jeffrey Reset. He came to the aid of a woman who had been trapped in her car for 18 hours after it slid down an embankment and into a creek. Getting an award for it just seems, just seems crazy. I'm doing something that everybody else would have done. 
Also recognized were attorney Herbert Ibanagu and his wife Danielle. They took action to thwart an armed robbery in their neighborhood by following the fleeing suspect and then blocking his car with their own vehicle. Robbinsdale area schools have approved a different system for paying teachers. The school board approved QComp, which bases pay on several performance criteria. Robbinsdale is the last public school district in the northwest suburbs to approve QComp. Anoka Hennepin, Brooklyn Center, Hopkins, Osseo, and Wyzetta also have the program. Today is National Dress in Blue Day to bring attention to colon cancer. And colon cancer is the third most common cancer in the country, and it can happen earlier in life than you think. Sonia Goen shows us how a Rogers woman is fighting back from the disease. Everyday routines mean so much more to Kim Newcomer. I didn't, I never thought I would be sitting here right now. In 2008, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. When we were first told I was diagnosed stage four and that I wasn't surgical, I thought maybe I had six months. Although Kim had a history of colon cancer in her family, Kim's doctor didn't think she needed to be checked out because she was only 35 years old at the time. And every time I would tell my doctor this, he would say, oh yeah, you're healthy. Let's not worry about it right now. We'll worry about that later. Kim showed no signs of colon cancer. She's a runner, eats healthy, and works out often. People my age don't believe that they can get colon cancer. I had a um, nine centimeter um, tumor in my colon. Just like in Kim's case, oftentimes there are no symptoms when it comes to colon cancer. That's why it's so important to get screened. We can reduce the risk of cancer if you have a colonoscopy where a polyp is removed by about 90%, so it's a very safe and effective test. I think most people are afraid of colon cancer or afraid to go get screened because of the colonoscopy, which isn't pleasant, but it's, it's better than the alternative. It was a long road to recovery for Kim. She had three years of chemotherapy and four surgeries. She's now spreading awareness so others won't have to go through what she went through. We've lost so many people to this disease and um, it's not necessary. It's preventable, it's treatable, and everyone should go out and get a colonoscopy. You should know your, your family history. Sonia Goins, 12 News. The Centers for Disease Control recommends people over the age of 50 to get screened, but much earlier if you have a family history of cancer. Well, coming up, one of the busiest ice arenas in the state needs a few upgrades. And then later in sports, a close matchup between Osseo and Cooper in the girls' basketball playoffs. But first, an AccuWeather forecast we can be happy to read. Warmer weather coming our way. Seventeen-year-old Plymouth Ice Arena needs some renovations. The city hopes the state can help pay for about half of the $4 million price tag. Plymouth says its ice arena is one of the largest and busiest in the state. One of the busiest arenas in Minnesota. We have over a half a million visitors to this arena every year. Leadership in Plymouth has plenty of bragging points about the city's ice arena. There are regional and statewide tournaments serving more than 400 teams. But after 17 years, it's time for a few upgrades. Other than payroll, energy use is the second largest expense that we have. Renovation plans call for a new roof, new parking lot, replacing the cooling system, and converting the Olympic size sheet of ice to the smaller professional size. Going from Olympic size to professional size will have 28% cost savings in energy costs for the city. So that's really important too. It's, it's not just a matter of maybe trying to accommodate hockey players. It's really a matter of what's energy efficient. A new electric Zamboni like this cost about $130,000. It's part of the $2 million price tag the city says they'll pick up for the renovation. They're asking the state to cover another $2 million. I think that it's important for for people to step back and see what a regional contribution this ice center really is. Senator Terry Bonoff is one of the authors of the bill. Today she toured the facility with other lawmakers. Bonoff says this arena is much more than a community rink. We're a regional center and sometimes you know you think of us as being just part of the metro but when you look at actually how big the city of Plymouth is it equals the size of Mankato, Rochester. In terms of population we're on par with Rochester, Mankato, Duluth and St. Cloud and they have all received state funds for their ice arenas. Plus the city says this is the first time they've asked the state for bonding money. I think it's really important to note that Plymouth has not requested any bonds before so I think and we see other communities getting them I think it's really time to bring some of these tax dollars back to the city of Plymouth and really support this investment that really the taxpayers of Plymouth have funded in the first place. 
The state money would go toward a new parking lot, roof, and ice rink conversion. Coming up, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days, but they all light up the stage in Hopkins. But first, Park Center races to a big win in the opening round of Section Girls Basketball. John Jacobson is in next. Well, basketball playoffs heating up, and uh, John, you've got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, we do. A busy night in the section tournaments for girls. Back on the first week of the season, Osseo beat Cooper in girls basketball by 38 points. But after a slow start to the season under new coach Drew Woods, the Hawks improved and Cooper and Osseo came into their Section 5 Class 4A quarterfinal round game with similar records. Highlights from this one at Osseo. The Hawks' Lauren Johnson, nice pass to Tory Green, open along the baseline for two. And an early 9-6 Cooper lead. The Hawks make three three-pointers in the first half, including this one from Manita Kelly. And it's 15-10 Cooper. But Osseo comes back. Io Port left open at the free throw line, turns and scores. The Orioles were up two at the half. Osseo sophomore Lamia and Tutway in her most extensive varsity minutes of the season scored 12 points off the bench, one more than she had scored the entire season coming in. Orioles up seven, but back comes Cooper. Lori Bowler with a steal and layup for two of her second half, 15 points. Still the Hawks trailed by two with five seconds left. Until Alicia Sutton knocks down the open jumper, tying at 47 and sending the game to overtime. And in the overtime, Kiara Russell will drive the lane here for Osseo and score a bucket to put the Orioles in the lead. Russell leads Osseo with 16 points and they win it in advance 55-53. Maple Grove is the number three seed in section five. The Crimson had their playoff opener against number six seed Moundsview. Kayla Jones finding a McKenzie Barta open for a three in the corner. The Crimson take the early lead. 16 points for Barta in the game. Haley Barker, nice drive and dish here to Ali Schmidt for two of her 15 points. And it's 9-2. Moundsview's Becky Volkert makes a nice cut. They find her for the layup. And the Mustangs try to battle back in this one. Nice ball rotation. Crimson here uh, find Jones for a three. She had 16 points and Grove is up. 34-19 at halftime. Second half, Barda drives baseline, then finds Schmidt for the jumper. Maple Grove's lead 12 points at this point. Barker gets another assist, setting up Maddie Tharp for two to make it 44-28 Maple Grove. Moundview comes back, and a layup by Erica Johnson pulls the Mustangs to within six points. But Maple Grove holds on for the win. Barda with the three as Maple Grove advances to the semifinals with a 69-58 to 58 win. In the semifinals Tuesday at Anoka, Osseo meets top seed Centennial. The Cougars routed Wyzetta Thursday night. Maple Grove now faces Champlin Park. The Rebels had little trouble with Irondale in their quarterfinal game. Park Center's girls are in Class 3A, and the Pirates are the top seed in Section 3. Park Center hosting St. Paul Johnson in the Section quarterfinals. Defense leads to points. Kayla Morris jumps into the passing lane and goes all the way after the steal for the layup. He scores 24 points on the night. In transition, Danielle Schaub takes it in for the left-handed layup and a 25-12 PC advantage. Park Center runs the break all night. McMorris outlets to Ann Seminette for the easy layup. The Pirates are up 59-25 at halftime. Second half, and check out the pass coming up. Schaub hits McKenna Dubois in stride for the layup, and it's 61-25. Simonette's pass inside is deflected, but she gets it right back to feed Michaela Hayes for two. Pirates roll 89-48. They'll face Como Park in the semifinals Tuesday at Maple Grove. After losing their first seven games of the season, the Providence Academy girls basketball team came into the postseason with a winning record. The Lions facing Minneapolis Henry in the first round of the Section 5 2A tournament. Claire Counts drives and scores. That gives the Lions a 13-2 lead. Later in the first half, Taylor Miller is wide open in the corner and drills a three-pointer. Providence is up 31-4. Ashley Borland picks up an assist, feeding Heather Lohr with a pass to make it 40-8 Lions at halftime. Second half, and Counts drives the lane and scores. Providence goes on to win big 76-10. to The Lions play Watertown Mayor in the second round Saturday morning at 10 at St. Michael Albertville. 
And a big game tonight, Friday night at Rogers High School, Section 5 Boys Basketball Championship as Champlin Park takes on Osseo. You can see it tonight on Channel 12 at midnight. Got crews. Stay up late. <laughs> crews out there very yes, busy this time of year. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks, John. Up next, days that are so bad, they're actually funny. We'll preview a new play filled with hilarious misfortune up next. You'll lose an hour of sleep this weekend as we move clocks ahead one hour for daylight saving time. And that could lead to difficulties, supposedly. In the days after a time shift, research shows the risk for car accidents goes up, as do heart attacks. Workplace productivity also plummets. So why do we do it? Some authors suggest the, daylight, the extra daylight at the end allows us more time to go shopping and spend money. Ah, there's so the reason. we'll see. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> now, we all have bad days where it seems like nothing can quite go right. And if you're a young boy named Alexander, sometimes you have terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. Stages Theater in Hopkins is continuing its page-to-stage -stage season with another adaptation of a classic children's book. And Cassie Bonstrom has more in today's Weekend Showcase. I wish I could move with my sister. It happens to the partner. best of us. This has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. That's one of the lessons in Stages Theater's latest production. Dear Alexander. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day is about a kid who has a day where nothing is going right for him. It is one thing after the other with this poor, pathetic kid. And good guys get kicked on. The story addresses real life issues like hurt feelings and being excluded by friends. I say that he's my fourth best friend. He's no longer my top priority. Staying home that night. Kids in the audience can relate, says Grant Cohen of Plymouth, who plays Alexander, but it's the show's high energy and color that will keep them glued to the stage. It's a very high energetic play show, um, a lot of movement, where we go up and down the aisles, we're very interactive with the audience. Very bad day. Alexander's day gets so bad that it ends up being funny. You laugh or you cry, right? So we laugh a lot with Alexander. But she hopes by the end of the play, kids and adults come away with the bigger message. Having a bad day is a universal experience. What do you choose to do with it? Do you need to spread your rain cloud around to everybody around you? Or can you just endure through the day and trust that tomorrow's gonna be better? In Hopkins, I'm Cassie Bonstrom, 12 News. The show opens tonight at 7 and runs through March 23rd. And if you're interested in tickets, we'll have a link on our website. Check it out at 12.tv. We've all had those days. And this should be a good show. It's, I mean, it's fun for kids and a message for adults, too. That and there's take a good ending, yeah. which is what we all like. <laughs> That's, right. That's all the time we have for now. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great weekend, everyone.